All right. Um, so thank you everyone so far for attending our Juneteenth conference. I am excited to introduce our next speaker, Nate Rose. Um, he's going to come and talk to us about innovating our STEM education. This is a subject that for me personally, I'm deeply interested and excited to um, hear about. Um, and he's deeply in, and Nate is deeply interested in this because it fosters ingenuity and creativity among all of our young students. Um, our speaker has worked uh, his entire career with modern technology at various places in U.S. in the U.S. and in Italy. And he also supports nonprofits like AI for All and Nesby. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce Nate Rose. Nate, thank you so much for being on our conference. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I really appreciate this time and uh, I want to give like a fair forewarning. It's just about my background. So um, hey, everyone, I'm Nate Rose. I'm a so software engineer at Ripple. I work on the data infrastructure team. Um, and then I also do like concurrent graduate student work uh, focusing on research for neural engineering. And then I do this, This I get recently just got interested in um, nonprofit space. So I'm actually the technology board director at the Nesby Junior Bay Area. It, it's, it's a lot, It's but there's uh, overlap. So essentially I'm interested in learning and how we learn from data to accelerate business, how we model machines to learn for predictive outcomes, how we model machine learnings to reflect our inspired complex brains and then how we use that um, for building education systems to implement that learning. So just to start, hopefully everyone can see my screen um, about the contents of this presentation. Um, there's a bunch to cover and I'm hoping that the outcome with my lens as an engineer, I could shed light on two gaping holes in education. One is the deep rooted biases and how we teach students and assess them. And the second thing is the ad tech space. Uh, so to start off, we wanna start with like a working definition of what is intelligence. And we need something that could cover, you know, Stephen Hawking who had a motor neuron disease like ALS, with, but he was still able to be a lead researcher in theoretical physics to a worm, right? A worm is able to survive and you know, excrete, reproduce, there's still tiers of intelligence in between. Um, so I like to use this uh, French sentence, which just means the intelligence is the ability to adapt. And for time purposes, we won't discuss the hereditary versus environmental implications of how intelligence is created or built because it's highly controversial and it doesn't fit into time constraints of what we're looking to do. Um, so intelligence, uh, when it comes to this idea of education, we have to think that education is actually a fairly new invention. Well, secular education is. Uh, so during the 19th century, France required children to attend school and get out of factories and stop working for two cents on the dollar. Um, and that was due to the Jules Ferry laws that mandated all kids to attend school. So they needed a way to differentiate students who needed uh, specific needs and be given remedial work in classrooms. So Alfred Binet, who used the, the sentence, the, the ability to adapt to define intelligence, created this thing that we all know as the IQ test, intelligent quotient test. And there's caveats with Alfred Binet. Um, he's a French psychologist. He was also a hypnotist, which I guess was like the entrepreneur at the time. Uh, so he creates the IQ test and he uses this equation that's pretty interesting. It's just the mental age divided by the chronological age times 100. And inside the test, you can see examples of like pattern recognition and inhibition on how they assess the mental age of the students so that they can be placed in remedial classes um, in France. But then we get to a uh, weird turn in IQ. During the height of the 1900s, uh, eugenics was also prospering. 
Um, so IQ really takes an abusive left turn and Carl Brigham, who's a professor at Stanford University here in California, leverages the IQ tests for using and proven eugenics. So you can see the distinct differences in the initial test to here you can see the, the mammy caricature, even Eastern European caricatures um, in one of the questions asking which one is prettier. And then here's the, the output of his book in 1923, Carl C. Brigham, of which um, uh, cultures perform best during the IQ test, right? Uh, here you can see individuals from England, and then here you can see Negro draft, right? And uh, we can see that the, the IQ test just evolves over time. So though we're making you know, monumental breakthroughs inside the black community and African-American community, uh, Saudi Tanner Mosel uh, Alexander is the first African-American woman to receive a PhD in the, U the US in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, then Carl Burgum uses the modified Stanford Binet test to create uh, the college admissions tests at Princeton which is later evolved into the scholastic aptitude test, which is for the college board that he creates. And we know that today as the SAT. Then in 1944, the GI Bill is passed and in World War, World War II veterans are coming back home and they needed a way to scale for um, veterans coming back home to look into uh, 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 enrolling into college and universities. And during that time, you know, we, we have Brown versus Board here in the U.S., which is desegregation of education. We have in 1978, uh, the University of California versus Baki, which uh, rules in favor of affirmative action. Um, and we're making progresses, and I'm sure the SAT is evolving. But despite this, despite the, the admissions and entry, just last year in 2019, we can see that the U.S. college admissions was doing some sort of quid pro quo at certain universities where uh, they were granted college entry based off of either payment or some sort of favor. And then here in 2020, due to COVID-19 and influences, UC schools, University of California schools are actually suspending the requirement of the SAT. So this is almost 100 years to the day from uh, when Carl Brigham made that initial IQ test. So the assessment of, of intelligence has a systemic flaw. Um, and we, we've already identified that as an indicator, but it also plays to uh, job opportunities and matriculation. So this great NCES, which is the National Center for Education Statistics, um, monitored the class of 2005 and showed that only 4% were able to graduate with a STEM degree, science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, which you should beg the question, how many of them were women? How many of them were students of color? Uh, how many of them were later employed? So around the time that the 2005 high school class graduated, um, we, we're seeing the emergence of the, the, the tech industry and how that gets reflected. And if we double tap into one example of the tech industry, 17% of tech roles, and this is based off of 2016, 2015, uh, for Google, uh, only 17% are women and Black and Latinx make up 3% of their technical workforce. So we, we need to address the leakage between K through 12, all the way to college. Um, Elaine Seymour and Nancy Hewitt, uh, they created this really great book called um, Why Undergraduates Leave. Uh, they're uh, directors at the University of Colorado. Um, and 90% of students during their study in 1997, they leave um, from concerns about teaching practices. So the norms and discourse of the scientific community are not really explicit for universe, uh, uh, underrepresented minorities. Um, or first generation uh, students. There needs to be some sort of cultural relevance, which is the key that they're finding in their studies uh, for cognitive processing. So um, we need to start patching the pipeline earlier. And I actually volunteered at Raul Wallenberg High School here in San Francisco 
uh, I volunteered teaching computer science. Two out of 23 students were Latinx uh, in the computer science class, and there were no black students. And I just, my, my character, I started asking some of the black students in the hallway why they weren't in the computer science class. They were behind, uh, they were ineligible. They had no interest, right? Even if they were. Uh, so it's happening earlier and earlier. And these are students in San Francisco, the quote Mecca of Silicon Valley. So how are we, if they're not even engaging here when it's so accessible, uh, how do we expect them to really pursue STEM, STEM roles um, in the future? So there's um, some studies and research that's really being uh, done now, which is 2019. Uh, so uh, new research in neuroscience and psychology is hoping to bridge the gap between this. Uh, so a professor at uh, Harvard, his name is uh, David Rose, uh, he produced this universal design for learning, uh, which really looks at, um, if we break it down, it's really just asking, can you see yourself in the curriculum? Um, is the displayed information optimized? uh on, on the board or inside the 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 sheets the handouts the work the worksheets is academic discourse correlated to learning rate were were you exposed to the content for computer science in fifth grade when your parents signed you up for a computer science uh the summer summer camp uh, versus a student who's brand new to computer science starting from their fr their freshman year in college which one is a metric of uh, growth and opportunity to be successful in the course. Um, how do we address barriers to equity? Some of the students have to go home and, and work uh, because their household requires them to produce an another stream of income um, to support them. And also provide structure that uh, shows that the longevity persists. So the, there's a lot of work being done here. Um, in the nonprofit space, because to my opinion, the education system is really, really slow to addressing this issue. Um, so uh, can you see yourself in the education? Black Girls Code is directly addressing this. Uh, they're displaying, uh, using representation by black and brown women to embed them and show black girls that, hey, you can pursue a career in software development. Uh, there's the Interact Project, uh, where they're looking to build uh, design and UX skills um, with underrepresented minorities. Um, Hidden Genius Project is a really interesting one where they train talented, talented students to um, be commissioned for, for work, for software development work in their communities. So just imagine uh, a black and brown student saying, hey, my first job was building an app. I actually interacted with one of their students and he says he was making money um, managing a Shopify store. So uh, this, this is kind of the new age of students and uh, ensuring that they can leverage technology and virtualization uh, for even income. Um, I was a part of Teals, which was founded by Microsoft uh, and they do computer science curriculum as Hack the Hood does as well. Uh, and then there's also this uh, new one, AI for All, um, which we partner with um, that does open learning for understanding concepts about artificial intelligence. But this is a lot. And um, for some parents, they don't know where to go or this, 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 we need some sort of aggregation to being able to surface this to, to parents. So I created my own and um, I landed my first job at Microsoft um, six years ago through an organization called the National Society of Black Engineers. And it's sort of my conviction to continue to open doors since it was a gateway for me to enter the tech industry. Uh, so I, what we do here, we created our own nonprofit 501c3 where we aggregate these programs for modular learning. And we use a brand that the industry recognizes and a network that stems from like a college dorm room all the way to directors, VPs, presidents at engineering firms across the industry. So here you can see Destiny and Kylan, they're using 3D printing pens to draw when they should be, I think they were supposed to be building parts for a drone. Um, here you can see a mirror. Uh, and we started this less than a year ago, last, last September actually. And we embed black professionals and allies in the classroom uh, from 
K through 12, and we deliver hands-on STEM learnings with emerging technology. So drones, um, beagle bones, microcontrollers, artificial intelligence. Uh, and then we work with the parents to assure that they reinforce the learning at home. So here is Desmond, uh, Desi. He is working with a DC power supply uh, for his drone circuit. Uh, that he's built. So he's actually learning Ohm's law. So uh, voltage is equal, current times resistance. So we're giving like an applied intro to algebra, physics, and electrical engineering through an immersive experience. Uh, then here's Christian. Uh, Christian's a PhD student uh, at Berkeley, the undergraduate in Yale. Um, and he's giving a talk about bioluminescence inside the, with the group. And uh, we work with the Black Graduate Society at UC Berkeley to give guest lectures to keep it, you know, refreshing and engaging for the students. And we have this fun fact and working uh, uh, a joke that every time we invite someone to give a guest lecture, something happens in real life. So when he gave this lecture, this presentation, um, the California beaches at night were lit up with bioluminescent waves. Uh, we also had Bria, who uh, did a water, a water filtration lecture, and Alameda County actually had to shut down their water due to health concerns around the same time, and that was a few months after Flint, uh, Flint, Michigan. And we even had Reagan, who uh, came in and did a, a talk about AQI, so air quality index. And then the next month, we had to stop the chapter from continuing because the Mendocino wildfire happened and all these kids were wearing masks. Uh, so um, I told them we got a clause inside of our relationship where they're not allowed to bring any nuclear engineers or anything because we don't know what will happen if they, have, if they bring one. But um, here's Cam, he, he's teaching Amir how to uh, fly a quadricopter. And he also founded his own ed tech firm with targeting drone education for K through 12. Uh, so not only is this environment, this system through Nesby, we're able to, you know, teach students, but we're also creating jobs, uh, innovative jobs, where we're able to address our community's concerns, right? And then we keep the parents engaged because they get involved with adding the culture to the environment. So they have a collective say on how their kids learn and what environment they want to foster, foster inside uh, this, this cohort. Uh, so here's a shot from our Black History Month where we were doing a, a book exchange at the table. Uh, so this is all great stuff. And then that Rona happened. Um, COVID just hit us after everything that we were building up to. And the, re the remainder of this talk is an asterisk because uh, we're living through COVID every day. Uh, as COVID-19 is still very much a threat and California is actually seeing a spike. So um, in addition to everything that's going on prior to this, prior to COVID, kids in education and the education system, they were already dealing with a pretty hectic cycle of news stories. So here you can see a uh, California judge uh, blocks Betsy DeVos from withholding relief money from undocumented students. So that's Betsy DeVos. She's the U.S. Secretary of Education. Um, she's looking to withhold uh, relief money for undocumented students, which is directly uh, representative here in California for our Latinx community. Um, there were more mass shootings than days in 2019 here in the U.S. And school shootings are very much a thing. A Texas teen was banned by high school from attending graduation after refusing to cut their dreadlocks, um, which to me, uh, I have twist locks in my hair right now, so I couldn't even imagine um, being banned from school and uh, that, that, that scenario. So uh, video shows here, here's another headline, video shows a Florida school deputy grabbing middle school girl by her headscarf and he was fired. These are all headlines in the past two years. Um, just to show you the, the magnitude of uh, kind of racial uh, distress that some of the students are going through on a daily life. And this last one, uh, DeVos demands 
uh, public schools share pandemic aid with private institutions. This one was too easy to debunk, so I had to share it with you guys. Uh, so private institutions, private schools, one in 10 students in the US go to a private school. You can see that here. And then about 70% of the students identify as white. So it, it's pretty just blatant with the data, it just shows who you're targeting when you when you make statements like that after um, all of, all of this, you know. So for Nesby, we we had to make a transition as well, and we transitioned from something that was engaging and in person to something that was virtual um, relatively quickly because we were already doing some partial virtualization of our program. Um, and in the first year, we, we we started, we went from, I think Azaria here kind of uh, shows it, went from super engaged to, you can see some of the students here, like just defeated, like, I don't wanna be on this. I've been looking at a screen for the past five, five days straight. I don't wanna do this on my Saturday. So we're seeing engagement tank. And um, that's actually something that all teachers are facing in this space. Um, so here, here are some of the post COVID questions that we're, we're still trying to address that we're still trying to solve right now. Uh, so prior to COVID, you know, having a laptop was, in, in middle school was a privilege to some black communities. Now it's a requirement. Uh, so do students have reliable devices and internet connections? Uh, we're hearing stories about students having to drive to McDonald's, having to drive to libraries, um, which were closed during quarantine, um, just to submit their their ass assignments for their classes. Can we keep engagement in the classroom? Um, how do we prevent child burnout and keep them driven inside the, 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 the cohort? This is something that both education and our nonprofits are trying to figure out. Uh, is there the child's um, home a safe place for fostering learning? Uh, are are they surrounded by something that um, can foster a learning atmosphere? Some students rely on school for providing breakfast for food, uh, so we we don't even know what what they may be facing inside their own homes. And what how do we account for disabilities virtually? How do we account for mental disabilities virtually? Um, and there are some companies who are attempting to tackle these these questions in real time. So Google expanded their free Google Hangouts to 250 students, which was great because that's the freemium. Now we can host Google Classroom Hangouts um, for free. You have Docebo, which is what we use for AI for all which provides open learning and modular learning, and they're making it more accessible. Uh, Duolingo, um, which I use uh, pretty daily, uh, now teaches ABCs to students who are in, who are supposed to be in preschool. Uh, Real, Real Talk is another great example. They are looking to connect with students who are facing uh, mental trauma and illness or um, frustration and uh, distress during this time. So right now there, there, there's really a call to action for solving these problems because uh, directly we're, we're seeing such a, a shift in how education is being conducted. And I had a conversation with one of the uh, school district teachers that we work with and she was mentioning that they're actually starting to think about, hey, um, should we have two different courses or two different um, uh, uh, swim lanes where uh, swim lane A students would attend high school from Monday and Wednesday, and then swim lane B, they would attend Tuesday and Thursday, and then they would be virtual on different days. They still have to go through the same program, but how, how does a high school student uh, manage to keep engaged in a virtual uh, learning uh, they're, they're just testing out the idea, um, but again, this is all experimental. 
So we're, we're coming to a close and I'm hoping that the, just the takeaway uh, from this is really, here's a punchline essentially is um, to support nonprofits financially or partner with them who are tackling education, um, offer your skills. Um, so if you are an engineer, if you're a lawyer, if you're a financial advisor, join a board, um, help them rebuild K through 12 education right now. It's a, it's a prime time to really do this. Um, engineers, maybe we don't need another JavaScript framework for a little bit or a Kubernetes tool. Let's solve this problem first. Um, and companies continue to improve your virtualization. Um, finally, uh, just challenge, uh, disrupt the ad system and make sure you're disrupting it with ad tech and then challenge the standardization of testing and curses to academic success, challenge um, degrees from top institutes, because what did 2019 show us? That you can actually do a quid pro quo to attend, uh, to be admitted potentially, um, and challenge IQ and those monikers. And finally, stay engaged with the space, uh, because tomorrow's generation starts in the classroom. So this is how we we, we really build a environment of what we want to see from um, to tomorrow's generation. And thank you, Nate, for this. And people ask all the time, what can you do to help? Nate just got a beautiful slide to show it. Thank you so much for this talk. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, awesome.